So was New York everything that you wanted it to be when you arrived? It was. Yeah. It was. I mean, I have to say, like, I had a vision of what New York was and what the people were and just what the vibe was when, you know, I was leaving Detroit and New York didn't disappoint. Yeah. It, it, it just, you know, New York had and still has, you know, a certain magic and certain types of people that I, you know, it, it did definitely didn't disappoint. If anything, it was even, you know, more than I anticipated. Welcome to the Words Matter Pod with the Kill Pinaka podcast dedicated to storytellers. I'm here with culture journalist, curator, and author of Contact High, a visual history of hip hop, and most recently, Ice Cold, a hip hop jewelry history. Vicky Tobek, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you again. I'm very excited for this interview. Ever since I heard of the book and I said, you know, maybe this would be like a good idea of me to, you know, reach out to Vicky and and uh, see if I could get this interview to happen. Um, definitely want to give some credit to uh, Jamel Shabazz because uh, I saw that you guys were uh, following each other. And I, I interviewed him recently. I didn't put that interview out yet, but I asked him if he, he had a contact on you and he said, uh, you're very responsive in your DMs. So I DM'd you and you responded. And, you know, that was back in December. Uh, you were traveling, but we were able to make it happen in January. So thank you once again. Yeah. And thank, I mean, thank you, Jamel. Jamel, I mean, he's an inspiration to so many people, yeah. myself included. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to collaborate with him on Ice Cold and on Contact High. So um, we're, we're two for two. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how, how did you get in contact with him? With Jamel? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, I think it was just through email, but I can't remember if it was um, through like a photographer friend. It must have just been through, you know, somebody in the photography network. I actually don't remember. I usually remember, remember how, but, um, but, you know, so grateful that he responded because I initially reached out to him to include one of his photos that the Roots had used for one of their album covers in Contact High. Um, and that was just a really important photo that I wanted to include in the book. Um, and I know, you know, everyone loves Jamel and is constantly hitting him up. And so I was so grateful that he, he was responsive to me because he's so, you know, if you know Jamel and how giving he is of his time to so many photographers like both established and up and coming um i don't know how he finds time yeah. to do it to be responsive and so giving and so um i mean he is just a national treasure he, he's a national he's a legend really but i, I yeah. told him that he's a legend and he was he was being humble about it but always yes. <laughs> no that's what makes him incredible he's so humble his his legend to humble ratio is like you know, yeah. probably, probably one of the, the biggest ever. Mm -hmm. uh, where are you located right now? Um, I'm located in New York. Okay. Um, so who are you? So I'm uh, Vicki Toback, longtime uh, writer, journalist, um, one time, you know, worked in the, in the music business in, in my early days. Um, but, you know, I consider myself predominantly a, a writer, journalist, author. And uh, when you were five, your family emigrated to Detroit from uh, Soviet Union era, Kazakhstan, a predominantly black city, which influenced your love of black culture and hip hop. But what makes you want to take the next stop step to cover hip hop as a journalist and pretty much dedicate your life to the culture instead of just being a casual consumer? It was, you know, and, and yeah, you did your research. You know, I grew up an immigrant kid in Detroit of the 1980s, um, fell in love with 
the music I was hearing, which wasn't hip hop quite yet. It was more like uh, Motown, soul, funk, house, you know, all, all the stuff. I mean, Detroit, in addition, in addition to being, you know, predominantly black city, it was also predominantly black music city. So yeah. I grew up, you know, knowing Anita Baker lived a couple miles away and, you know, my, my friend was, um, you know, the, the mailman to Aretha Franklin. And so it was just kind of like in the water. And I started hearing hip hop in high school, really, um, in the late eighties, um, and fell in love with it. And, you know, I really, at the time was a fan, you know, I was actually wanted to be a photographer when, you know, when I grew up and, but I moved to New York, you know, knowing that that's where everything that I loved was really happening, um, which was, you know, hip hop, music culture, club culture, downtown culture. Um, so I moved to New York um, and really just wanted to be part of it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't super intentional. It's just, it was something that drew me um, to be there. And, and it wasn't, you know, such a direct line. I mean, I started interning for a small magazine called Paper, yeah. became, became their culture critic. Um, I had a night job at this really important nightclub called Nell's um, and was, you know, just really young. I mean, this was like, you know, 18, 19 years old, but just kind of putting myself in spaces and around people that were doing the kinds of things that I love. And that is how um, I got my job at Payday um, through, you know, through people that I knew and met at, um, at Nell. Yeah. You said in an interview a while back, uh, around the time that you released Contact High, that uh, you, you were talking about Detroit, and you said everything I learned about music, I learned through that city. Motown is really embedded in the fabric of the air there. And all the things that I absorbed about American culture, both good and bad, were through the lens of music. How do you become a, a fan of American culture? You know, Motown first, of course, um, without solely embracing the stereotypical aspects of it, because oftentimes it's easy for people and children um, specifically to gravitate towards the, the negative tropes because that's easier to digest. When I was, you know, growing up teenage years and even preteen years, um, we didn't have a car yeah. and, and, you know, this was pre-internet, pre all of it. So a lot of what um, I, I, I listened to a lot of radio um, and there were a, a lot of radio and a, lo a lot of local television. And there were two programs. Um, they weren't necessarily mo like Motown programs, but one was the radio show was called The Electrifying Mojo on WGPR. And he came on at like midnight. And everyone, in, you just had a feeling that like everyone in the city who was into certain things was yeah. listening to, to that show. And he played funk. He even played like craft work from Berlin. He played all the kind of early, you know, funk and soul and like would mix in sort of elements of Motown um, on that radio show. And he, you know, did this like soliloquy every night where, you know, he would invite his listeners to like, come aboard the mothership. And if you're, he would say like, if you're at the end of your rope, don't give up, tie a knot. <laughs> and, and then he would play this incredible music. And I remember even Prince called in um, wow. one night randomly to his show because Prince would listen too. Um, even though he wasn't local, like he would somehow get the cassettes, you know, of this show. And, and I think just like, sitting in our little apartment, you know, new to America, but sort of understanding that like some magic was coming <laughs> from the radio that was like just outside my door. Um, and then that, so that, you know, I, I don't know, like I wasn't thinking about negative stereotypes. I was just kind of embracing the, the things I was hearing and it just felt magical. Yeah. Um, and then 
so that radio really inspired me. And then also um, we had a show that came on. It was almost like an after school show. <laughs> it's called The Scene. And it was like a local dance show. It was like our ver- version of like Soul Train. Yeah. Um, And same, like played, I guess, the beginnings of early like techno and house and funk. And and I just, you know, that was sort of what I grew up on. And that's what I came to learn as like what America was. And again, this was like pre-internet, pre, you know, having access to so much. So I was just learning and learning to love the music yeah. and, you know, and the, and the culture through, through those ways. And I mean, anything, any negative aspects, I understood that it wasn't because of the music or, you know, that it was something, something much bigger than that. Yeah. So can you say that you and like you and your parents kind of learned how to be American together? Yeah, you know, I mean, neither of my parents really learned English that well. Um, And a lot of, you know, what a lot of immigrants go through, like they're just trying to figure it out. Um, I, you know, a lot of times had to like speak on their behalf. Um, So I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that they fully like became American. You know, they were both older when we moved here. Um, and so they were just kind of really struggling um, and just trying to figure figure it out. I mean, it's such a commonality, you know, to mm-hmm. young immigrant families where the parents really kind of sacrifice to like, you know, do for for the kid. But even even just figuring out how to like get benefits or how to enroll your kid in school or how to like apply to, you know, college, like my, you know, that was all things that like, they had no idea. So we did, you know, we were figuring things out together for sure. Were they only listening to the things that you listened to or did they have their own taste? No, 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 no. That they weren't listening to that stuff at all. Like they had actually had like, you know, my mom really loved classical music. She had like some records, you know, um that she had somehow gotten a hold of um and yeah it was mostly it was mostly rec- like records and then pop culture yeah. on tv yeah was it hard for them to understand like your passion for uh music you know cuz they're adults you said they're older so they really developed their own identity in a different country Yeah, you know, I think the thing that was really hard, I mean, and, you know, my dad passed away really early, so it was really just me and my mom. And I think the part that was really hard for her is that um, I got involved with, like, club culture really early um, at, like, 14, 15. Um, I was going to, like, house clubs in Detroit. um, And you know, and hearing like all the early house DJs and seeing stuff. So I think she was more that that was more worrisome to her that like, you know, her 15 year old daughter was like in downtown Detroit on a Thursday at all hours of the night. Um, But it's funny, like I wasn't doing anything, you know, quote unquote bad. Like I really was just so in love with the music and you had to go to the clubs to hear it you know you had like that's that's where it was all happening and i was just going there for for the energy Mm -hmm. so you know back to what you said you moved to new york and you went to school you worked at uh payday records um but then you went from working in the music business as a record label executive to becoming a journalist so how does that happen Yeah. So I was, um, I was working at a nightclub called Nels, which was a really important early club. Um, Biggie filmed his big Papa video there. Um, Diddy and Russell Simmons, like every, you know, everyone would come and hang out. It was like quite a, quite the place to be. You know, Basquiat and Warhol, you know, were known to go there. So it was this real mix of like, downtown culture and kind of emerging like hip hop culture. Um, And 
through uh through the people that work there um i met um patrick moxie who was running um uh payday records at the time and managing gangstar and they needed just like a you know it was it was a small team there were only five people working there at the time and he really just needed someone to like come and answer phones and just be like an office you know just kind of do whatever was needed to be done Mm -hmm. Um, and when I got there, like I did all those things, but also, you know, very quickly started to be the one that would, um, inter interface with the press on behalf of the groups. Um, and that included like doing all their photo shoots, um, scheduling, you know, scheduling and sitting in with like interviews and the artists really grew to trust me as their, you know, essentially like PR person. Yeah. So, you know, really quickly, you know, Patrick was like, okay, you're 19 years old and I hired you to be this like girl Friday, but you're actually the director of PR and marketing now. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. So it was, you know, it was just like a very organic, like, do what you needed. Everyone did what they had to do. And that happened to be my place where I excelled, which was doing like marketing and PR work with, with the groups. Um, at the time there were also a lot of, um, upstart magazines starting because the mainstream press wasn't really writing about hip hop too, too much. So magazines like the source rap pages, ego trip, um, on the go, like all these kind of early, um, independent magazines were born. And so people, you know, the writers and photographers for those magazines, myself included, weren't like, you know, journalism school graduates, or we weren't like, you know, journalists with a capital J, we just knew the music, we knew what was happening. And we started writing about it. We started photographing it and documenting it. Um, and these magazines sort of came up as, you know, as the music came up. Um, so my, you know, and myself included. So I was working at the label, started writing for, you know, magazines. Um, and then just really fell in love with the the writing part of it and just kind of continued, you know, down that path. Yeah. Um, in that same interview that I just mentioned uh, with Lens Culture, you you said that you wanted to move to New York to be a part of the magic that was happening in the music there. So was New York everything that you wanted it to be when you arrived? It was. Yeah. It was. I mean, I have to say, like, I had a vision of what New York was and what the people were and just what the vibe was when, you know, I was leaving Detroit and New York didn't disappoint. Yeah. It, it it just, you know, New York had and still has, you know, a certain magic and certain types of people that I, you know, it, it did definitely didn't disappoint. If anything, it was even, you know, more than I anticipated. Yeah. Um, how do you compare that to Detroit? What city do you prefer? I mean, look, Detroit is, Detroit made me, Detroit will always have my heart. You know, I, that said, like, I could not wait to leave because (laughs) the eighties, eighties Detroit, it was, you know, not that much opportunity and it was just, it was a hard, hard place. Um, but it was, I'm so grateful that, you know, we landed in that city because it really um, shaped me. Um, in New York, you know, New York's New York. And it was just a whole different thing. And what I loved about New York, I think more than, you know, just about any other city, especially at that time, is like you could really break out of your kind of expected lane there. You know, a lot of people say, you know, it's the place you can like fake it till you make it or, you know, hustle, like hustle your way. And and if you if you have that mindset, especially back then, um, like anything, anything was possible there. And I think that's 
was more the case than yeah. Detroit at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm from New York. I'm, I just moved to L.A. recently. But people say that about L.A., you know, you could just fake it till you make it. But, you know, who knows? But, I mean, yeah, I, pe- people say fake it till you make it. I think when people say it about L.A., it's sort of different because it's literally like fake it. Yeah. But New York, when you say fake it till you make it in New York, it's something different. It's like the it's like the way Diddy had that spark and he was already a billionaire in his mind. Yeah. 19. You know what I mean? Before he quote unquote made it, Mm -hmm. he in his mind was already that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. Like, you know, when fake it till you make it as it applies to like New York energy, it's like aspiration already that thing in your mind before you become it. Yeah. Can you can do that where, you know, L.A. is, I think, a little bit of a different, yeah. different piece. But yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's more uh, aspirational, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've never lived in L.A., so I just. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you worked for other publications. Um, you worked as a producer and a reporter. Uh, you worked at Bloomberg, CBS, CNN. Um, but those are different than the smaller hip hop publication. So were you doing similar work to what you were doing when you were working at the the hip hop publications? Yeah. um, So, I mean, after that early stint of payday, the small, you know, magazines, um, also just living in New York at that time, I got really, I got really interested in sort of topics that the music was talking about like Mm. economics politics um sort of the stories right that 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 like informed what like the community of hip-hop culture was experiencing and um and so i went i went to go work for um cnn because i was i was kind of just just got more interested in you know politics and and the economy and all that stuff. So I went to cover Wall Street for CNN, um, which seems like such a big change. But in my mind at the time, it made sense. Because I was like, oh, I grew up hearing, you know, Public Enemy and Gangstar and all these people kind of talk about, you know, three strikes laws and the, you know, disenfranchisement of, of, the economy and the community. So like all, all that stuff I, that I learned through hip hop and was experiencing even growing up to a degree as like, Oh, I want to go and cover that. Like what's really going on. And, and so that's when I went to go work at CNN. I worked as a producer for them um, first covering wall street, then covering um, early internet and tech. Um, and then, um, did the same for Bloomberg and, and CBS. So, you know, so I, I, that was sort of a little bit of a turn in my, in my Mm -hmm. career, but, you know, also really glad to have done that. And also hip hop always like, you know, stayed on my shoulder through everything I did. What did you learn from working there? You know, I just, I learned that like, it's sort of a 360, you know, that everything's really connected, you know, that, you know, hip hop culture and the culture of Wall Street and the culture of like big politics, even though they operate in their own like silos, they are really, you know, connected. And I think, I think that's probably my, my biggest takeaway mm-hmm. from having having done all all of those yeah did you go into work at these publications with the intentions that you wanted to uh, encourage them to focus more on hip-hop culture or were they just stepping stones so that you could pursue being more of a freelance writer on more creative platforms you know neither you know i didn't really have I have to say, like, I wasn't, I I never had like a five year plan and I never was like super intentional with like, if I do this, it's going to lead me to this or it's going to like, and, you know, I I probably should have been more like that. I really 
kind of followed my heart and my interest a lot in what I did for my career choices. Um, and, and still do, you know, and, and still do that's, that kind of drives what I write about today, the kind of book projects that I do. Um, but I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe if I was talking to my younger self with some words of advice, I would have said to be more intentional, you know, with, with the re- like the reasons and the timing with yeah. everything. But at the time we were just, you know, we were just kids. Like we were just trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, you know, main focus in your work is photography. Has that always been a focus in the things that you've done before? Yeah. Well, like I, you know, I mentioned earlier, I actually, before I fell in love with writing, I wanted to, I was really interested in photography and I had a, you know, Pentax K1000, um, beginner, you know, analog camera when, when I was, you know, a teenager and, and used to even develop in the dark room. Um, so I, I just, and I loved, you know, especially like documentary photography. Um, but yeah, I never really knew like how to become a photographer or yeah. how to, um, and by the time, you know, I was working in magazines, I just really loved the the writing aspect of it. But, but I, you know, still to this day, um, consider myself a very like visual writer and that's why the kind of books I do now always pair storytelling and writing with you know visuals and photography mm-hmm. and I mean visuals are and photography are, tell stories as well absolutely yeah yeah um but why is visual storytelling important in hip-hop I mean visual storytelling is important for everything you know I think um, we live like humans are hardwired to respond to visuals. Yeah. Um, I think even, you know, even if you don't speak the same language or if you don't speak, you know, a certain language, you can look at a photo of something and, and understand the story behind it. And I think, you know, with the rise of social media, um, just our world becoming much more connected and much more visual. Um, I think that's really, really important, but just about everything, like we're, we're hardwired to, to respond to visuals that like connected to our emotional core. So I think words and, and visuals together are really, you know, just a powerful way to tell stories. Yeah. And uh, when you were doing uh, PR at, at labels, um, is that something that you kind of focus? Like, you did you focus on the 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 narratives or the story surrounding artists? Yeah, I mean, you know, it at the time we didn't have like Google metrics or you know, not we we were doing a lot by feel and relationships and you know the the magazines were just super important um we didn't have the internet yet so when i was doing pr um it was really just sort of an interface between the reporters and the artists but but really having to understand who the artists were and what they wanted to say to the world, you know, and I was really lucky because I happened to be working with some of the greatest minds, you know, in hip hop of all time, in yeah. my opinion, which is Gangstar, you know, Guru and Premier. Um, they're, you know, they're gang- the Gangstar Foundation, you know, J. Ru, Group Home, even, you know, then like Show and AG. Um, and, you know, we even had Jay-Z for a singles deal as well. I, a mutual friend of mine was just just reminded me, like, remember when you hired me to write, you know, Jay's bio? I think that was... I uh, remembered, but I was like, oh. Um, and then, you know, and also Mos Def yeah. when, when he was um, in a group called UTD before, you know, he became part of Blackstar. So 
you know, I was lucky because I worked with greats. I mean, before they were greats, but people that had stuff to say, um, that had a presence, you know, that photographed incredibly. Um, and so I, you know, I never had to like sell anyone, you know, or convince anyone like, oh, just interview this artist and yeah. get them some press. Like, you know, we knew what we, yeah. what we had. So, um, yeah. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't because hip hop wasn't what it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, we gave a lot more access to writers and to photographers. Um, we didn't have to be as guarded as artists have to be today. Um, I mean, you know, sometimes people would pop off in interviews, you know, and you'd have to just be like, listen, don't, I'm like, don't say that next time or don't, you know, think about maybe not, you know, telling your whole business next time. But, um, but for the most part, yeah, all the artists I worked with knew who they were, knew what they wanted to say. And, you know, I was really just there to help facilitate and and be a a small part of that. Yeah. I was, I was saying, um, wasn't it uh, that in my lifetime, Jay-Z, the single that he put out on payday? Um, uh what uh, no it what was it i don't i can't, I don't I can't remember yeah <laughs> um i know that um clark kent produced it yeah um and you know clark was you know such an early but yeah i think i think it was in my lifetime i yeah. think that was and i can't believe we had him for just a singles deal i mean that <laughs> you know the story of artists that got away yeah. and, and labels that's that's a whole that's a whole other thing most deaf too right i mean we had you know most deaf left payday and went to raucous and you know and did black star yeah. um, so you know neither neither letting jay you know leave or most deaf was my was my call yeah <laughs> this isn't the first book you curated uh can you tell us the process of how you go from being a journalist to getting to the point in your career where you get multiple book deals? Well, I didn't get multiple book deals at once, yeah. but um, I, you know, did my early, you know, my early label stuff and writing stuff, had enough of a, you know, track record in, in writing and then coupled with working at, you know, the big, national press outlet, CNN, CBS. Um, I had sort of come back to writing about what I love, which is, you know, hip hop culture and was really at the time interested in exploring the visuals of it, you know, cause it was, it had been like 40 years on at that point. I mean, now it's 50, but it was a time where hip hop, you know, had amassed this great archive of music, visuals, stories, And when I set out to write Contact Time, my first book, I really just had a vision for kind of pulling all of that together. And I knew that, you know, book form was sort of the best way to tell that story. Um, And, you know, it wasn't it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get. um, I mean, book deals are just ask anyone. I mean, getting a book deal and delivered and all of that is like such a labor of love. Um, and I definitely had a couple, you know, false starts with it. Um, and finally, you know, it was, it was, a a old friend of mine from the music business, you know, who's since passed away, um, who was a record promoter and like, you know, he was so, use Gary Harris was his name who's like tied legendarily with um D'Angelo's career amongst many others but he was you know I told him the idea for contact high and I was like I'm trying to get a book deal and he basically like A&R'd me because he was like that's an amazing concept like it needs to be a book what's the problem and so 
you know, he, he spoke to me almost like an artist, you yeah. know, like, uh, like, a, you know, your demo is hot, like mm-hmm. it needs to get out there. And, um, and so he, you know, he helped me find a book agent and that book agent helped me get um, a book deal. And then with the success of Contact High, um, you know, selling so well and being received so well, um, I was able to do Ice Cold. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to get some introduction into your, your early life before I get into the book. So, you know, now to get into the book, uh, are you allowed to tell me how much that ice cold piece was on the cover? Oh, <laughs> well, so it's, I mean, it's hard to say cause we had it made, mm. um, we had it made by Aviani jewelers. Um, and, and so you know, that was just done. It was just a one-off for yeah. the car. Um, and it was, you know, made for us as, you know, as a favor, if you will, to be on the cover. So I can't really share much beyond that, okay. but, you know, people can kind of do, do the math. Yeah. <laughs> so or how much are you into jewelry yourself? You know, I, I was never a jewelry, big jewelry person. Um, one, you know, I could never afford it growing up and two, like just being in New York and, you know, you just kind of want to make sure you're not like that person, a mark. Um, I did, you know, have some early jewelry. Like my mom actually gave me um, a Nefertiti piece when I when I was young in Detroit, which I still have. Um, But so just kind of here and there, you know, I never I never I was more like admiring it on others rather than, you know, having having my own collection. But I have to say, like doing ice cold now, I am like you know, saving up for my presidential role. <laughs> no, like now I'm like, now that I know all everything and all the, you know, details of different styles and watches, like I, I think that's where I'll be investing going forward. You can we'll get, a, get a big yeah. chain, get a big chain from Eliante that says uh, Vicky on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have security walking around with me, so I don't think I'm going to be getting anything like that, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> um, every photo in the book is accompanied by a caption describing in full detail the style of jewelry the subject is wearing and what jeweler made it. Uh, were, were you already like, I mean, I know you didn't have a lot of jewelry, but did you know much about jewelry prior to making ice cold and and doing the research yeah no i mean i you know anyone that grew up around hip-hop um especially in the early years like you knew you understood how important jewelry was to you know people's looks and also you know working in clubs right you knew like if someone showed up looking a certain way and, you know, feeling like they could move comfortably in those spaces without, you know, getting, getting, you know, their chain snatched or getting stepped to, like, you knew they were someone of importance. And so I, you know, grew up witnessing that with my own eyes and being in spaces and, you know, and seeing that. Um, And, you know, all of the early stuff, if you love hip hop, right, you know, Slick Rick's Justice Scales, you know, LL's Dookie Rope, you mm-hmm. know, you know, Roxanne Shante's earrings, like, and, you know, you also know, if you grew up in, you know, kind of neighborhoods that were, you know, where hip hop came up, you knew that there were like, neighborhood, um, like jewelers, and where people would go and like, buy nameplate like nameplates or you know different pieces and like every neighborhood sort of had like a local place where people would go um and in detroit we had a place um in northland mall um where you know people would go so i kind of you know i already knew and also just being around artists too i remember like guru from Gangstar would always wear like this like crown pendant 
um, started seeing a lot of like the early, you know, label chains starting to emerge in the 90s. Um, so I knew, I knew that much, yeah. you know, I knew that it was like a part of the culture and, and I knew a lot of the, you know, jewelers just from, you know, you listen to the lyrics, you hear Jacob mm-hmm. the jeweler, you hear Tito, um, you, you know, you listen to Biggie and Jay and early, you know, Biz Marquee and stuff. Um, and so that was sort of what I knew going into this, but then, you know, the contemporary stuff and then just learning about like how grills culture, you know, emerged and traveled and like grew in the South and all of that. Um, all that stuff I learned through, you know, doing interviews with people like Eddie, Eddie Plain and his brother Lando, um, you know, who kind of pioneered grills culture. Um, so this book was, I, I'd say, you know, Ice Cold was a combination of me coming into it sort of knowing and witnessing a lot through the years and then a lot of research on top of that. Yeah. Uh, prior to hip hop, black musicians and, and street guys wore jewelry. But when you look at those images, like artists like, artists like Curtis Blow on his debut album, um, that's featured in the book and, and a picture of Big U, the reggae artist from the 70s and 80s, the jewelry was very subtle. Uh, the chains were thinner, the, you know, almost always yellow gold, not like platinum or, or white gold now. Um, and by the time the crack epidemic came in the mid eighties and the chains got longer, uh, the pendants got bigger. Then you fast forward to the aughts and 2010s, jewelry is huge and almost always white gold. So, I mean, yes, rappers did start to make more money by the nineties, but do you think that that's the only reason for the shift in the chain length and the emblem size and the metal type? Well, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, the the Curtis Blow album cover, you know, is credited as being the first time you see jewelry on a hip hop record cover and you look at it and they are very um, thin, you know, layered um, and you can kind of trace exactly what you just said, sort of the way jewelry looked, the materials that were used, um, all, you know, all the way to today, you know. Um, But I think the change, like the change that you're asking about where you, it wasn't just about yellow gold anymore and you started seeing platinum and diamonds. um, I don't think that was just because of money. You know, hip hop has a tradition of remixing and, and customization and not having anything that somebody else might have, right? Being different, being that dude that's like the individual. So those three reasons, I think, is why hip-hop musically and in the way it looks and in jewelry is always like reinventing itself. So, you know, in that moment, you know, a lot of people credit like Jay and Diddy for sort of ushering in that like, platinum use of platinum and diamonds you know and jay notoriously said like time to separate you know the white gold from the platinum yeah. even though two things might look alike the cost and the rarity um are quite different um so i think it was more just to be up on something that that you know the rest of the world wasn't yet um aside from the money yeah. So I think I think it was just to, you know, separate just themselves, to be, be unique. Yeah. yeah. Uh, most major hip hop cities like New York and uh, L.A. and Atlanta and Houston have the the go to jewelers. Go to jewelers. Um, if you can, can you say like what are the similarities and differences between all these cities and their relationships with jewelry? Yeah, I mean, just like, I mean, New York is, you know, credited sort of as the birthplace of hip hop music, but everyone knows that shortly, you know, thereafter, pretty much any community in the United States, certain pockets started to, you know, it was very regional, like Atlanta started having its own style. Detroit started having its own style, Chicago, LA, and then, you know, the South. 
And, you know, the way things sounded were very different musically than what was happening in New York. Mm -hmm. And the way people looked and the way they dressed was very different. Um, So I think the jewelers sort of followed, followed suit, right? Like the jewelers of the South, um, you know, Icebox today is really well known. Um, When Eddie Plain went, you know, from Brooklyn to Atlanta to do grills, you know, he started kind of adhering to like different styles. That's one of my favorite stories in the book. What? That's one of my favorite stories in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, the jewelers were just responding to like what people wanted and what people wanted to look like. And, you know, in LA, people weren't wearing the big, you know, shearlings and the Kangol hats and all that. They were wearing Dickies and Chucks and white tees and, you know, and just like the gold, like the simple gold. So there were definitely similar, you know, similarities, I think, you know, especially in like the, um, like iconography that a lot of people were wearing, but, um, but the styles were a little different in each region. Yeah. Um, what city do you think has the best jewelers? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, right now, probably Atlanta. Mm. Uh, of all time, probably New York. Yeah, I was I was gonna say New York. You know, I'm supposed to be uh, non biased, but I'm just reading an article and just thinking about how even how Eddie is from Brooklyn. He's from Suriname, moved to Brooklyn, yep. then moved to Atlanta. And now like, cause I remember seeing that store on um, his gold shop in Atlanta in, uh, in ATL, the movie. And, yeah. and it's like, I'm thinking, you know, a guy from Atlanta started that, but if it's New York, you know? So it's like our, our reach is so broad. It's like, you put us anywhere. The influence is just, gonna totally yeah. yeah and now you know eddie's brother lando um is he moved to miami well, right yeah he yeah. is he's out of miami um so the yeah the reach like that hip-hop internet is like so powerful yeah um but yeah no i was you know i was gonna say new york too um i mean new york of all time i mean you gotta you gotta give it to to new york yeah. but um but you know Atlanta definitely in, in recent years um has just gone crazy with it too. I mean you look at like Gucci Mane's collection, um little baby, you know, everyone, even like the women, right? Look at like Lotto and you know Cash Dolls from Detroit, but you know she spends a lot of time in Atlanta. Um, you know, even the women that are starting to, you know, collect and commission all these jewelry pieces, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's really cool to see. Yeah. Uh, what rapper has the best jewelry to you? Oh God. So I think of all time, it's, you know, it's gotta be Slick Rick. Yeah. I know you're going to say that. Yeah. He, you know, he's just the king of this thing. But um, I will also say, you know, Pharrell and increasingly Tyler. He has a um, very creative uh, jewelry collection, Tyler. Yes. Yeah. And he, you know, I think where like, he also has such a eclectic taste, you know, and he has like a collection of Cartier watches, like not all of them working. Um, and he's just, you know, he just has fun with it. And, um, I think is like has benefited, right? Like he's so studied, I think in his approach to music, like you wouldn't know it, but he like, you know, he's really studied. I say that in a, in a good way. And I think he applies that to his like aesthetics, um, visuals, you know, into his jewelry too, you know, and he is like stands on the shoulders of like yeah. Pharrell's jewelry collecting, um, who stands on the shoulders of, you know, Slick Rick's mm-hmm. jewelry collecting. So yeah, so I would say my favorite, like of all time, it's gotta be Slick Rick. Yeah. But, you know, Pharrell and Tyler, um, amazing too for yeah. different reasons yeah 
yeah, yeah. You, you could tell Tyler he's very intentional in everything he does he's down to the jewelry yeah mm. yeah but you'd never you'd never know it it's like yeah. it's not like it's not like a try hard intentional it's yeah. like a studied intentional mm-hmm. yeah. uh have you got any uh pieces created no I mean other than the the pieces that we made for the cover of the book, which is, um, I mean, the Tashin nameplate, which was made by this jeweler, um, the jewels, um, and the Aviani, you know, ice cold pendant. I haven't had anything made, especially, Hmm. um, you know, I definitely have my eye on a few things. They're not custom though, like, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing custom. Yeah. Uh, what would you I say? did, I oh, did okay. bid when Pharrell was selling his jewelry though. I did bid on his Rubik's cube piece and I was outbid, um, unfortunately, which I think, you know, Drake bought pretty much all the pieces from that auction. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know if you bought the Rubik's cube piece, but anyway, so I did, I did try, but I was outbid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to, uh, people who condemn the, these large pieces of jewelry due to a number of reasons, whether it be how expensive they are or just the potential bodily harm that can come with you wearing these pieces? Look, I would say that. That's such a deep question, you know, and very, it's, it's complex, you know, it's not as simple as, as that, right? I mean, I would say, first of all, you, you know, nobody should tell or make judgment on, you know, when somebody who makes money based on their success, you know, what they spend it on. Um, And you know, there's also, there's often like this tinge of, of like racism or like coded yeah. language a lot of times where people assume that, you know, they see, a, you know, a black man with a chain that like, he doesn't like, he bought that chain, but he doesn't also have a house and he doesn't yeah. also have a car. It's so, you know, I, I would sort of like turn the mirror to the person asking the question, first of all and ask, you know, do you even know what it is you're asking and why you're asking it? Mm. Number one. Um, Number two, look, like, people, you know, people, yes, are target people with wealth that have things. I mean, we live in a capitalistic society, um, even in non-capitalistic societies, right? That's just human nature where people want things are desperate for things are hungry for things that they don't have. Um, It's not the fault of the things, right? It's the fault of what is happening that makes that person need or want to get those things. Mm -hmm. So it's a really heavy question, you know, and I, I, I don't like to like people who just oversimplify it like, Oh, they shouldn't be a target by wearing those things. Or, you know, why is that young rapper spending his money on, you know, diamonds and gold, you know, cause so I just think, I just think it's, that's a question that's oversimplified that you can't ask that question without being ready to talk about, you know, why people haven't been able to build generational wealth and why certain communities have been, you know, disenfranchised for so long and why, cause it's all tied in, yeah. you know? So I always say like, you can't take the best of a culture and not take the rest. Yeah. I say mm-hmm. that about this, that question too, to people like saying like, if you're, if you're ready to ask that question, let's be ready to have all the other conversations around it too. Yeah. Well said. Uh, that leads me to my next question. Uh, Ice Cold was released around the time that PNB Rock was murdered uh, in an attempted at jewelry robbery. Uh, is it bittersweet to know that, yes, you know, having a big chain or watch is a symbol of success and it's treated almost like a trophy, but at the same time, wearing these items can can cost you your life or lead to public humiliation? Like, how does that 
make you feel? Or is that kind of like, did your, does your last answer kind of answer that? Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say similarly, you know, to my, my last answer, I think applies here too. Um, I mean, that was heartbreaking and look, that could have been anything. He could have been jacked for his car yeah. that he was driving. He, um, you know, could have been robbed for just the cash in his wallet. So, you know, I hate to say that it's just jewelry. People, people want things. Yeah. People are desperate for things and um you know jewelry is just a very evident way but you know it, I, i'll i'll say this too like i remember when cardi b you know went on youtube or went out sorry on um instagram live to show off like her watches that she had just bought for herself and she was like you know oh like i've got all this money on my wrist if like things turn bad, you know, I can like turn, you know, sell this watch and, you know, start. So she, and she was so, and she was even said, she's like, I'm so proud of myself. I bought these for myself, you know? And, and so I always say like, let's celebrate, let's celebrate that. She's so proud of herself. She, you know, she bought that for herself and anyone that's going to judge her for that is, you know, is, is again, needs to kind of look at themselves of why they're judging, you know, a young, you know, a young woman for, for being able to do that. And, you know, Cardi is not just buying the watch. She has a house. Her kids are well taken care of. She's, you know, probably bought her family a hat. Like she's good. Right. So don't worry about, Cardi, like, worry about why you're worried about Cardi's watch. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that it's almost like a, um, almost like victim blaming in a way when when these things do happen to people, right? It's like, yeah. um, you know, r- robbers are going to rob regardless. So, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Miss Toback, you've been working in hip hop culture for over 30 years and you're still working hard, traveling, building relationships. Many who start in this world of music and media don't last long. So what's keeping you motivated? You know, I just kind of go with stories that I'm drawn to and I'm excited to, and I hope to keep doing books until, you know, I can't. Um, I mean, storytelling and love of, of books is sort of what keeps me going. Um, you know, I've been so lucky to be able to do, you know, two books now, um, one of which was turned into an exhibition. And, and so I think that's just what keep, you know, keeps me going is just, I love, I love telling stories, um, and I'm working right now, I'm working on a book with LL Cool J for the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Um, and I think that's it. You know, I, I, I asked a writer friend of mine recently, you know, how they like how they pick their projects. And and they said, you know, when I see something that needs to be in the world that isn't yet that's when I do the project, you know, Mm. that, that what needs to be in the world, like what story hasn't been told, what hasn't been done. And that's increasingly hard, but, um, but I kind of, you know, I remember those words that, you know, he said to me because it's like, you can do so many projects, you know, people will green light things all the time that don't necessarily need to be out in the world. They're, often like a rehash of things that have been done. Yeah. So, you know, I always like to kind of like test myself, you know, when something is pulling at me for an idea is like, does this need to be in the world? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you feel like you're filling voids. That's what keeps you motivated. Yeah, I guess, or I guess, you know, what keeps you motivated is just, contributing to this culture that like I fell in love with at such a young age, you know, and and the way that I do that is through, through storytelling. Mm -hmm. 
is the person you are the person you've always wanted to be? Huh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think I'm still, you know, moving and, you know, career wise, right? Like there's, there's still things I want to do and, and write and, and do, but, but I feel like I've always been the same person. Like I still feel like myself. And I still feel like I do things for the reason that I've always done them, which is really out of love and passion and interest. So I've never, you know, I, I, I can say, yes, I am the person that I've wanted to be because I'm that same person. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the book with LL Cool J you got coming up. Uh, what's next for Vicky Tobek? So th this book with LL Cool J um, will be out at the end of the year. It's called Make Some Noise. Um, and it's a celebration of, you know, the last 50 years of hip hop and the greats who made it. Um, and other than that, I do have a couple other things, you know, in the pipeline that I can't quite um, talk about yet. But, you know, all around similar similar stuff. One thing I can talk about is an, another book I'm, I'm working on is about the history of um, basketball uh, and style. Mm, wow. So like a style history of, of basketball culture, which is also so enmeshed with, with hip hop. Yeah. So, yeah. So that'll, that'll come, that'll come after. Can't wait to check those out. Um, so Ms. Vicky Toback, you are a writer, uh, a journalist, um, an author. So why do words matter to you? I think words matter to me because they signify some kind of truth and some kind of story. You know, I'm also someone, you know, that moved to this country, not be able, being able to speak English words. And, and, you know, I understand what it is to not be able to communicate. Um, and I think that's why I fell in love with books and storytelling. Um, and that's why, you know, words are really, really important. Thank you. Um, so everybody listening, everybody watching, please like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, rate me and comment on uh, Apple Podcasts as well. Get me up there on those charts, charts for uh, society and culture. And uh, once again, thank you. Ms. Vicky Toback for all of your contributions uh, for Ice Cold, um, everything you've done in the past, uh, Contact High, um, all your work you've done as a journalist, and uh, I'm looking forward to, and I'm sure everybody else is looking forward to everything you have coming out in the future. Thank you. Thank you. No, this was cool to be on a, on a podcast that's like dedicated to words, as you said, and, and storytelling in a way. And, um, you know, I, I listen to your other podcasts, which are so great. Thank um, you. So, yeah, I'm really grateful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, uh, you know, good luck. And uh, I'm glad that you, you could fit me into your busy schedule in your press room. Of course. Yeah. I'll be I'll be back with the next one, too. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. Bye. bye.